So hello, I'm going to talk about the Einstein-Cartan theory today. So if you haven't really seen any general relativity before, this will also be a kind of a bit of a crash course on general relativity. But I'm going to build up to the Einstein-Cartan theory, but not really go into too much detail about much of the, the maths. Just try to present the intuition. Okay, so first of all, what is Einstein-Cartan theory? Well. Essentially, it's just a, a, formulis a formalism of studying general relativity, which I'll just shorten as GR. So, first of all, what is general relativity? Well, it's a theory of gravity. And it can essentially be summed up in the following kind of sentence, or just the following relation, that this is the profound realisation that Einstein had, that gravity is not a force, but is in fact a consequence of space-time curvature. So let's state that again. Gravity is essentially the same thing as geometry. So this was the key realisation that Einstein had, that essentially gravity isn't a force in the traditional way we think about forces, say electromagnetism. It's not propagated by quantum particles or anything fanciful like that. It's simply space-time geometry. So hopefully you're kind of vaguely or somewhat familiar with the idea of space-time, essentially that we have three dimensions of space and then the dimension of time. We kind of package them together as a, a four-dimensional object. So the geometry of this kind of four-dimensional manifold is what gives rise to the force or the effect of gravity. Now it's not actually a a force in the traditional sense, but it's it's rather a consequence of particles that travel through the curved geometry. And so the kind of the usual analogy that people use is that you kind of imagine space-time as being kind of like this rubber. They usually use a two-dimensional example, so we have some kind of two-dimensional plane of space. And then if we introduce some mass into this picture, so this is a a flat space time initially, we introduce some mass and then this kind of adding this mass or energy rather then causes this space time to curve. And you've probably seen people do this with rubber sheets and bowling balls and stuff like that. And now essentially you should view this flat space time, we add matter to it, or energy rather and it kind of causes this flat rubber sheet to kind of sink down and have this kind of weld that starts to appear. And then this is how we kind of visualize the gravitational effect on space-time. It just causes a curvature. And now if we introduce another particle into this picture far enough away, it will just travel in a straight line as if it were in flat space. But if it gets close to this, the the curvature, or as it gets close to this mass, it's going to feel the effect of travelling in this curved geometry and it's going to follow some kind of orbit trajectory. So hopefully you've kind of seen this analogy before, it's usually called the, the rubber sheet analogy. And now, basically this is kind of alright to visualise, but it's really, really kind of missing the point of what general relativity is all about. So. There are a number of things which are really wrong with this analogy. The first is that, well, it kind of relies on gravity to even work in the first place. Gravity is what's causing the mass to bend this rubber sheet. That doesn't really make much sense without having gravity in the first place. But essentially what this analogy is better representing is simply just a particle that's moving in a potential well. So if you have some kind of potential This would be the potential well. So this is the potential of, let's just say, a particle moving in one dimension. It's going to want to move into this lower potential state. And that's essentially what this analogy is representing. It's kind of representing the gravitational potential that's created by this 
large mass in the centre and that causes particles to want to move towards it. And why do they move towards it? Well, because they're rolling along this kind of curved surface. But in reality, space-time doesn't literally bend inwards towards massive objects. In some senses it kind of does, but in this kind of literal sense it, it doesn't look like this in reality. What we're actually kind of representing here is what's known as an extrinsic curvature. So this curved, or well, the, the, the rubber sheet analogy, is really representing an extrinsically curved object. And now extrinsic is curvature that's apparent to us because this object is living in some higher dimensional space. So I said that this was a 2D, a two-dimensional flat space-time to begin with, and we're kind of just implicitly realising that this lives in some kind of higher three-dimensional space, the kind of space that we're looking at it in. And now we can see this curvature happening because we're looking at it in three dimensions. We can see how this sheet is bending to create a kind of bowl shape. But this, this isn't the curvature we're kind of interested in general relativity. This is curvature which is only apparent because the space exists in some high dimension. So to an observer that's confined to the surface, they wouldn't notice any of this curvature at all because it's just really an artefact of how it's the space is existing in some higher dimensional space as a whole. So to an, to an observer in this space-time, they just think they're in flat space-time and they just travel as they would in a flat space-time. Okay, so I've rambled a bit about this analogy. I'll just go over again why it's not so good. Essentially, well, for, apart from requiring gravity to even make sense, it really does represent more a particle that's travelling in a potential well, and that's that's fine, it kind of get, gets you used to the idea of how potentials are going to affect particles motion, but it, it really kind of misses all of the uh, more subtle um, details which are captured by the, 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 the curvature of the actual geometry. And so the, the way that this analogy fails is that it's essentially, it's talking about the wrong kind of curvature. It's talking about this extrinsic curvature, which is curvature that we can only see because the space-time lives in some higher, bigger space-time, or uh, dimension higher. So when we do general relativity, we like to talk about space-times as being kind of on their own. They're not embedded in any higher dimensional space. So we think we live in a three-dimensional, three spatial dimensions and one time dimension, so we have a four-dimensional space-time, that's our universe. And that's everything, we don't have some higher five-dimensional space which this universe is contained within, and so any kind of extrinsic curvature, our universe could be bent into some fifth dimension, but we'd have no way of knowing because that's only apparent if you're looking at it from the fifth dimension. So in general relativity, when we talk about gravity, we only want to look at intrinsic curvature. So this is different to extrinsic curvature because it only re or it's it's measurable by people or entities that reside in the space-time itself. So if the space-time is intrinsically curved, that's going to be noticeable by observers that move within that space-time. And this is well, where it's useful in general relativity is that observers that live in space times they can measure intrinsic curvature and that's what tells them oh there's some gravitational effect that I need to respect I'm, I'm traveling through an intrins intrinsically curved space time and the gravitational force is then affecting me somehow so whilst this analogy is okay it kind of gets the basic idea across that space-time does become curved and we're kind of visualising it in slightly the wrong way but essentially the, the idea is close enough that space-time curves and then this is what causes our particles to follow essentially non-straight trajectories or rather the particles think that they're travelling in a straight line but they're just travelling in a straight line through an intrinsically curved space and that then leads to 
all sorts of orbital trajectories and stuff like that.